Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming here tonight despite all exams and field trips and um, um, paper writing. Um, a very warm, warm welcome on behalf of uh, CU Center for Religious Studies. Uh, this is the fifth and last lecture of our series on the Abrahamic religions, which has been initiated and kindly supported by John Shattuck, our president and director. The rector himself, unfortunately, is not able to come tonight because of business abroad, but he sends his regards. Um, before I introduce the speaker of today, let me recall the topics we have covered so far in this series in order to show the wide variety of perspectives from which our speakers have approached the overarching theme of the Abrahamic religions. Our first speaker, Susanna Heschel from Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, presented a variety of examples of Jewish scholarship on Islam in the 19th and 20th century. Why this fascination with Islam was her question, and she showed how Jewish scholars on the one hand presented Islam as being derived from Judaism, and on the other hand, how this argument was used for explaining the relative tolerance of Islam toward Judaism, especially in medieval Spain. Our second speaker, Abdel Mashid Shafi from Tunis, looked at Abraham as a legendary figure and showed how these legends can be used for emphasizing commonalities, but also divergences between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Our third speaker, Hans Kippenberg from Bremen, also emphasized the reconciling as well as conflictual potential of narratives about Abraham but not so much from a philological and historical point of view, but rather with respect to migration and diaspora existence in a globalized world today. As he put it, when Jews, Christians, and Muslims establish communities abroad, they are inspired by the story of Abraham, the first migrant. Our fourth speaker, Angelika Neubert from Berlin, returned to more philological questions, but not philological questions about Abraham. She rather addressed recent developments in Quranic studies and explained how this field has developed in its own particular way and at the same time should be integrated into a larger context of late antique studies. Moreover, she raised the question how, for a change, the textual understanding of Jews and Christians might profit from the new approaches in Quranic studies. All speakers so far have made an effort to critically rethink the concept of Abrahamic religion and its potential value for understanding religion today. Rather to my surprise, so far nobody downrightly rejected it. But we will see what happens tonight. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce one of Europe's most distinguished historians of religion. Hubert Kanzig studied classical philology, ancient oriental studies, with a particular focus on the Hittite language, and theology with a focus on the Jewish and Christian Bible at the universities of Berlin, Münster, Manchester, and Tübingen. In 1964, he received his doctorate for a dissertation entitled Untersuchungen zur lyrischen Kunst des Publius Papinius Statius, and subsequently worked as a researcher at Tübingen University. In 1969, he became full faculty member after submitting his Habilitation Schrift on the fragments of Lucius Actius, a tragic poet from the time of the Roman Republic. Since 1974, Hubert Kanzig has been professor and since 2003, emeritus professor of classical philology and the history of ancient religions at the University <coughs> of Tübingen. Among his countless publications are books on the historiography of the Hittites and the Old Testament, a study on the style and literary historical setting of the Gospel of Mark, and two volumes of his collected essays, one devoted to the studies of humanism in various periods and contexts, and one devoted to the histories, in plural, of religion. Both volumes have been edited by his wife, Hildegard Kanziglin de Meyer, a no less distinguished philologist and historian of religion, who I also welcome here tonight. However, everyone studying the history of religion, no matter what subject and in what period, knows that the name Kanzig is just not to avoid. This is primarily because he has been highly active 
as an editor and co-editor of dictionaries and handbooks, all of which had achieved the status of standard reference works, such as the Handbook Religionswissenschaftlicher Grundbegriffe, the Handbook of Basic Concepts and Religious Studies, the Neue Pauli, also available in English, Brühl's New Pauli Encyclopedia, and Religion and Geschichte und Gegenwart, also published in English as Religion, Past and Present. However, behind this engagement, I see not only encyclopedic interest, but uh, two major motives, and I hope I'm right, which also figure in the titles of the two volumes of essays just mentioned. One motive is the emphasis on the character of religion as a historically embedded phenomenon, embedded in linguistic, cultural, and especially political contexts. The other motive is to find a historically grounded answer to the question, what could humanism mean today? and how could it provide orientation in our present day situation. And this finally builds the bridge to what we are going to hear tonight. Professor Kanzig will speak to us about Hellenization, Romanization, humanization, the formation of an Abrahamic religion within the framework of West European culture. I welcome Professor Kanzig to the Roman province of Pannonia, as he has said it. Being, uh, please, the floor is here. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I thank you for the invitation and the interpretation of my fragmentary work. And I will begin at once with my lecture. This was built in 1747, in the beginning of the regency of Frederick the Great, the philosopher and enlightened king of Prussia. It was designed as the new center of his residential area in Berlin, the so-called Forum Friedrichianum. In order to promote the ideas of human tolerance, Frederick intended to erect a monumental rotunda, choosing as a model for architecture and for function the Roman Pantheon built by the Emperor Hadrian around uh, 125. I give you the next title and you will imagine the Pantheon in Rome. This building was, according to contemporary understanding, destined for the worship of all gods, especially for the cycle of the 12 Olympic deities. In the same way, thus the intention of King Frederick, the different religion in Berlin should congregate in different chapels of the same church. This was Lutherans, Calvinists, Bohemian brethren, and Catholics. After the conquest of Silesia, a predominantly Catholic region, the king dedicated the building to represent Roman Catholicism in his capital. Thus, ancient pluralism, modern enlightenment, and shrewd instrumentalization of religion combined to shape Western European Christianity. Now comes the next uh, I've yes, this is better. This Berlin Pantheon, the now so called Hedwig's Cathedral, is but one piece in a great urbanistic puzzle. Let me explain the area as it is to be seen up to now. On its right side, there is the opera dedicated explicitly to Apollo and the Muses. In front and on its left side, there are the university and the Royal Library. In the background, there are the Protestant Cathedral and the old museum. Friedrich Schinkel has installed there the statues of the 12 Olympic deities in a rotunda, and he explicitly destined them for meditation. All this is outshined by the golden orientalizing cupola 
of the Great of the New Synagogue in the Oranienburger Straße. This urbanistic ensemble shows Abrahamic religions in context, embedded in and limited by other religions, by science and by art. It is beautiful stuff for comparative research and necessary disillusionment. For in the same area, you will meet up with the monuments of racism and book burning, which remember the collapse of a prosperous, educated, God-fearing society. This collapse too is stuff for comparative research into the history of Abrahamic religions. I will go on with my second example. In the first half of the second century, an educated Christian author, by tradition called Luke, the physician, composed the first history of a new Jewish sect, the community of Christians. His two volumes, later on called Gospel and Act of Apostles, provide us with a prehistory of the three categories by means of which we try to describe the specific formation of Western Roman Latin Christianity. Luke's history comprises the message of the prophet from Nazareth and the miraculous growth and spread of the Ecclesia and its institutions. In Luke's history, the Ecclesia turns to the West, from Palestine to Ephesus and Milet, Asia Minor to Athens and Corinth, and finally to the head of the empire in Italy. The demographic shift from, uh, from Palestine and the institutional strengthening furthers the breaking off from organized Judaism. The split becomes sharp and explicit in doctrine and in ritual. The Christian claim the divinity of their Messiah and declare circumcision superfluous. Both decisions increase the compatibility uh, with the new teaching with the Greco-Roman theology and lifestyle. In essence, the historian Luke makes his hero encounter Greek philosophy. They meet in an open urban space, Agora and Areopagus, every day. They have informal talks with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers and other changing participants. The resounding names, the habits and the philosophical discourse create a distinctive atmosphere. This is Hellenismos. St. Paul speculates on the unknown God and quotes even verses on God, man and universe in Greek. It is a scholarly debate. No Greek priest or theologian intervenes. Finally, an Athenian couple is converted Damaris and uh, Dionysius Areopagita. His name stands for the Neoplatonic transformation of Christian theology and Greek in the Greek and Latin church. From Athens, as you know, Paul goes uh, to Corinth, the metropolis of the Roman province Achaia. Here, Luke the historian gets the chance to exhibit in his next chapter the Roman counterpart to Greek Paideia. The Jews of Corinth, he reports, charged Paul with breaking the Jewish law by his preaching. The judge was Junius Gallio, at that time proconsul of Achaia. Paul could not defend himself because Gallio, sitting on his bench, did not admit the accusation. I judge crimes, he said, not trifles of Jewish religion. The sympathies of the Roman authorities are clearly on the side of the Christians. The Corinthian Jews, Luke reports, were disappointed at Gallio's judgment and began to beat their leader, and this in front of the proconsul. Luke emphasizes his point, saying Gallio did not care. There are more Romans in Luke's history who, like Gallio, represent Roman law, military, and the empire. Luke concludes the second volume of his history in Rome. He does not, however, end up with Paul's death. Rather, he suggests an ongoing presence of Paul in Rome. 
the last words of Luke's history are, Paul, being a Roman citizen, stayed as a prisoner in his flat in Rome, proclaiming the kingdom of heaven and teaching the things about Jesus with all freedom of speech and without restriction. Such are, according to Luke, the beginnings of Romanizing Christianity. And my third example for the beginning, we go to the year uh, 1993. And in this year, 1993, the Parliament of the World's Religion has promoted in Chicago a declaration toward a global ethic. <coughs> the principles which the parliament declared were elaborated by my former colleagues at the Institute of Economical the Ecumenical Theology at the University of Tübingen, especially by Hans Küng and his pupil Karl Josef Kuschel. As an offshoot of the project Global Ethic, there appeared a year later Kuschel's monograph Streit um Abraham. English title is surprisingly quite in the other direction. Uh, a symbol of hope for Jews, Christians, and Muslims, London in 1995. In this volume, Kuschel draws up a picture of an Abrahamic ecumene. The project Global Ethic by Hans Küng and Kuschel's Abrahamic Theology are outstanding examples of a most welcome humanization of religions. They put an extreme stress on the real or supposed moral implications of religion. They refuse religious fanatism, war and xenophobia. Their outlook is global and critical of European modernity. They adopt the discourse on human dignity and human rights. They even emphasize equal rights for men and women and freedom of religion. Thus, the Global Ethic Project adopts on a large scale the achievements which the humanist movement in Western Europe, the philosophical enlightenment and the civil revolutions have accomplished. The project dismisses, however, its own roots, it sacralizes culture and replaces by religion popular wisdom, knowledge by history, Enlightenment, Jurisprudence, Philosophy. Similarly, the Abrahamic theology is derived from biblical texts and commentaries, homilies and prayers. This theology, says Kuschel, is a prelude to a theology of religions which has a biblical foundation. This might become sincere theology. The structure and history of Western European Christianity, however, cannot be grasped by these means. It seems therefore necessary to explore in greater detail on which foundations this process of humanization that global ethic and Abrahamic theology display is based. Besides Abrahamic theology and the unitarian claims of global ethic, there is, as you know, comparative study of two or three Abrahamic religions. For instance, Guy Strumser, in his inaugural lecture as a professor of the Abrahamic religions in Oxford, insists on the study of religion in its cultural and historical context and states clearly in what it is different from the Unitarian conception of interfaith discourse. I quote Strumser. This Unitarian conception strikes me, me as Strumser, as belonging to interfaith discourse which is best served outside universities. Such discourse, says Strumser, is a trap into which scholarship should not fall, lest it forgets that the most interesting aspect of the comparative st study of phenomena is not so much the similarities as the differences between them. <coughs> More precisely, scholarship should mainly focus on understanding how and why genetic or structural similarities function differently in related systems." End of quote. I could not more agree, but I should like to add that also the Unitarian conception remains an object of critical investigation, 
comparing, for instance, the churches of Saint-Simon or Nathan Söderblom and Friedrich Heile. Friedrich Heile searched for a path from the religions of mankind in the plural to the religion of mankind in the singular, the Menschheitsreligion. The formation of the Western branch of an Abrahamic religion and the framework of Western culture is a long, still ongoing process and certainly an unwieldy, bulky topic for a short lecture. Both sides in this conflicting system, that is religion and culture, are complex, dynamic, changing entities. Consequently, it is a multifactorial, conflicted process which is proceeding in different areas, in different social strata and multilingual substrata. I have to confine myself to some aspects and episodes. These are, according to my competence as a classicist, the ways and forms in which the Greek and Roman heritage was used, transformed and misused. Both sides of that process have inherited certain parts of Greek-Roman civilization, that is religion and culture, both inherited certain parts. Religion as well as the more or less autonomous non-religious segments of culture and public life as there are art, law, ethic, science, history, and so on. Mm. These segments have their own foundation, structure, and development. Each of them contributes to and conditions the formation of Western Christianity. The intertwined story of culture and religion is a main topic of the comparative religious history of Mediterranean and European Christianity. This story evidently cannot be told, described or explained nor evaluated and used for new answers by a foundation myth and a theological explication on Abrahamic origin for outcomes are not necessarily determined by origins. The forces which shaped the Jewish reform movement, which was called Christianoi by the Roman authorities, are labeled Hellenization, Romanization, Humanization. The frame is, in the beginning, the Roman Empire, which establishes a fairly integrated circum-Mediterranean unity. In this empire, Jews are permitted to become Roman citizens without adopting Roman religion. The Pharisee teacher Saulus from Tarsus in Asia Minor, for instance, was accused in Judea, being, however, a Roman citizen. He was entitled to appeal to Caesar, the imperator, and the tribune of the people in Rome. So he was conducted as a prisoner from Caesarea Maritima to Italy. In Rome, Paul meets a Greek-speaking community. His holy writ is the Bible in Greek. The Hellenization of Judea and the Jewish diaspora is a prelude to the process that we attempt to investigate. The achievements of the Hellenized Jewry are preserved in the Christian tradition. That is the monumental historiography of Flavius Josephus. He writes in Rome the philosophical allegories of Philo and Alexandria, the tragedies of Ezechiel written in European language and meter. Here we learn what Hellenization means. It is the critical reconstruction, the philosophical explication and poetical version of non-Greek history, wisdom, myth and religion. The Jews were not the first to become Hellenized. Before them were Italy, Rome, and the Celts in the Rome in the Rhone Valley. Both Hellenization and Romanization rely heavily on colonies, on economical, military, and cultural predominance. Hellenization, however, never intended 
the explicit spread of Greek religion. The Romans took over from the Greeks letters, coins, elements of law and art. They learned Greek. They introduced Greek deities together with Greek rituals, cultic images and priestesses. Their literature starts with the translation of Homer. They built theaters, introduced Ludis Kaniki, and adapt tragedy and comedy, and finally philosophy. The Romans welcome all hieresis, all schools of philosophy. First, the Pythagoreans, who, are, who were a homegrown sect from southern Italy, but also Euhemeros, the atomistic and the skeptical doctrines. This massive influx generated two opposing views upon what nowadays is called the essence or identity of the Romans. Greek historians simply declared that Rome, Roman culture was Greek. Roman scholars deplored the corruption of morals and religion. They remembered Rome's pure origin. When there were no luxurious temples nor refined images, but simple and cheap worship and more piety. The process of Rome's Hellenization and the debate about its results might be compared with Jewish debates on gymnasia in Jerusalem or with the accusations uttered by some Christian authors who suspected Greek philosophy to be an incitement to all sorts of heresy. All these groups were acting under the charm and the pressure of Greek lifestyle, art, literature, wisdom, and science. Greek culture, apparently, is a challenge. But why? Let me present but three motives derived from reception history. First, the Greek were great empiricists and decided builders of rational systems. They created elaborated language systems which comprehend the physical and the spiritual world. For instance, grammar, logic, rhetoric, poetic. Second, their view on world and mankind was designed by poets and philosophers, by physicians and historians. The beginning with Homer is considered as an act of liberation. There is in Homer little magic, less mystery but precise chronology and synchronisms, coherent causality, radical anthropomorphism, splendid characterization of individuals. Homer exhibits his world on the shield of Achilles. You have a sketch there in the picture. This is a detailed, systematic and comprehensive way Ocean and heaven define the space in which private and communal life is going on, urban and agrarian life, peace and war, a lawsuit and a wedding, and finally harvesting, vintage and dancing. Young, beautiful and richly adorned people are dancing. This is Homer's entire world. No underworld, no were an Olympus. Little room for it will, and in spite of all this, the shield is described while it gets fabricated by the god Hephaestus. The various segments of culture in Greek society are developed, what they say, from their own nature. That is law and justice, art and beauty, science and truth, philosophy and doubt, ethic and the idea of goodness, politics and the theory of community. There is much public cult in Greece, but little control. There are many but loose ties between culture and religion. There is no holy writ, no central organization of priests and priestesses, but religion and myth become early an object of criticism, of ethnographic and historical research. On the Athenian stage, the hero Sisyphus explains why religion has been invented by smart politicians. It is this structure of Greek culture that made its achievements easily acceptable for non-Greek cultures and religions, as for instance with due modifications, 
Aristotelian and, Aristotelian and Stoic ethics for the Christianity. Hellenization of Christianity is a controversial issue. Theologians, orthodox or heretical, focus on ecclesiastical decrees concerning the divine or human or mixed nature of the Christian Messiah, on the nature, substance, rank and equality of the members of Trinity, or on the nature of soul being immortal but not as Plato thought divine, nor subject to transmigration as Pythagoras contended. In this context, Hellenization may assume two meanings. One, clarifying an ecclesiastical or biblical tradition by using Greek logic, metaphysics, anthropology, psychology, or other way, corrupting ecclesiastical tradition by introducing Greek categories which are not to be found in the Bible, as they are usia, hypostasis, physis, prosopono, and Latin persona, essentia, substantia, and so on, which are evidently not in the Bible. When Hellenization is acknowledged, the question arises whether only the form has become somehow Hellenic or the content as well. I will not interfere into these subtle disputes. Historical evidence shows that Christians in the West both Greek and Latin-speaking people, be they more orthodox or more heretical, construed in you a true philosophy which was, in any case, a philosophy. Christians became teachers, didaskaloi, and they organized schools, didaskaleia. At the end of the third century, Christian era, Theodoros, the tenor, taught textual criticism, logic, geometry in his Roman school. Instead of the Bible, they were reading Euclid, Aristotle, Theophrastus. Some of his people, pupils were said to adore the physician and philosopher Galenus. They adopted elements from the mystery cults and got accustomed to decorate their tombs, houses and churches with pictures, mosaics and statues. In the end, the worship of images was recommended by ecclesiastical decrees. The images were greeted, kissed, venerated through prostration and incense. This is about uh, 400 uh, Christian era. It's, uh, I showed this picture uh, because it is a simple, normal uh, offering. It's not an ox who is slaughtered with much blood shedding or so, but this is what normally happened in a civilized Roman uh, house. Uh, an altar, small fire, little incense burning, and uh, a young uh, child bringing some fruits. It's a not bloody offer, and this is around 400 uh, after Christ. There was strong opposition, theological and violent iconoclasm, but the images were victorious. A theory was invented which explained the relationship between prototype and image. The veneration of the image goes through to the prototype. The, the Greek name is diabaine. The veneration goes through the, the, the picture uh, to the prototype, so no, not the picture is a dot, but through the picture, the prototype, and therefore you can accept uh, iconolutulia. The stress was laid on the difference between adoration and decoration. Scripture, says Pope Gregor, Gregor the first, 600, is for educated people, pictures are for the uneducated, the idiotai. In the famous 9th century, the Holy Writ and the consecrated picture are explicitly declared equal. The first one preaches through words, Pope Hadrian II says, the second through colors. Now, the first Christian historian, supposed to be Luke, became a painter before he was a physician, now he becomes a painter. 
For those who fought image worship, all this was idolatria or iconologia in short, paganism. So far to Hellenization and now I go over to Romanization. The process which transformed the Galilean movement, the heresy of the Nazoraioi to become the Roman Catholic Church is visible already in Luke's history. The process starts in Palestine itself. As a historian, Luke is interested in first-time statements. So he reports how a name was invented for the new movement in Antioch, the capital of the Roman province of Syria, perhaps by the Roman authorities. Luke writes, for the first time, the pupils of Barnabas Paul were called Christianoi in Antioch. The designation Christianoi is a blend of Jewish, Greek, and Latin elements, the meaning being people belonging to the Latin Messiah. A scale for measuring the progress of Romanization is the career of Pontius Pilatus. He advances from a military judge of the Roman occupation forces to an anxious sympathizer who is convinced that Jesus is innocent and that the charges brought to the fore by the Jewish authorities are but lies. Already in the second century, Pilatus is believed to have secretly been a Christian. In a, in a report he delivered to the Emperor Tiberius, he recommends to introduce the Christus by apotheosis into the pantheon of the Roman state religion. Pilatus finally confessed his conversion openly. He became a martyr and in some places a saint. And on this way, Pilatus came into the Christian creed. The same interest and imagination had the prophet from Nazareth changed into a Roman imperator. The religious language of Christianity is coined by military imagery, fides et disciplina, salutaris militiae sacramentum, that means uh, the Christian belief, the Christian mystery, Christian dorta, disciplina as doctrine. The faithful become soldiers. Christ is their leader and commander. He is called Dux and Imperator. The unofficial Roman Christology attributes him titles like Consul, Pontifex, Custos, Princeps, Victor, Triumphator, Augustus, and later even Caesar. A Christian sarcophagus exhibits a Roman legionary decorating his Imperator Christus with a laurel wreath. His cross now means the sign of triumph, the tropaion, and the standard of the now baptized legions of Rome. In the Archiepiscopal Chapel of Ravenna, this is the picture you see now, there's a mosaic representing Christ in the military costume of a Caesar. He is bearing his cross like a standard. The triumphant Constantine is said to be the model of this performance. Romanization transforms the suffering Messiah, the Redeemer, the teacher, into an imperator and his church into an empire. The process unfolds in three steps. First, in 313 Christian era, that is just 1,700 years before today, the non-Christian emperors Licinius and Constantine in their Milano declaration guaranteed freedom of religion to the Christians and to all. Everybody, they say, is entitled to follow the religion which he had chosen himself. Here, for the first time in Europe, the principle of individual and general freedom is not only invoked, but legally installed by the authorities to regulate the administration of a multi-religious society. And Christianity, for the first time, was received as a licensed religion 
by the Roman state. Christianity thus became part of the system of Roman imperial religion. You see a famous golden medallion. Uh, in the background is the god Sol, the Comes of the emperor, and in the foreground Constantine. You see the god Sol again on the shield of Constantine. This is the uh, cosmological, uh, natural vision of this god. And the soul behind is more the political uh, aspect of this goddess. And so we remember the first edict for religious freedom is done by an emperor in the shadow of the Helios. The system of Milano, this is the freedom of Christians and all other religions. This system survived after many ups and downs until the years 380 and 390. In these years, the Christian Emperor Theodosius I ordered by law that all peoples should adopt the religion proclaimed by the Roman Pontifex Damasus. The title Pontifex is freely taken over from Roman religion, as are other highly significant terms like consecratio, hostia, or sacramentum. This transfer from Roman religion to Roman Catholicism corresponds closely to the total ban of Roman religion in 392. So you took over and then you forbid. This is the, the entire process. The Patriarch of Rome had no rival in the Western Church. Later, when the new emperor of the West, Charles the Frank, came to power, he did not build his residence in Rome, but in far away Aachen. Therefore, the Roman Church could acquire huge properties. The state church emerges as a church state. This state gets its musical and juridical legitimation through the fictitious constitution or donation of Constantine. There is still a debate on where and when this document has been fabricated. Rome and the middle of the 8th century are a possible guess. According to this document, the Emperor Constantine would have transferred to the highest Pontifex Sylvester the following material and immaterial goods. I quote this in some detail uh, uh, for the reason that romanization is not an abstract something but is very concrete and very detailed. I will give you a short list of uh, uh, what Constantine is said to have given to the church. First, the primacy over the churches of Antioch and Alexandria, Jerusalem, over all churches of the world, even over Constantinople. Second. Constantine gives to the Pope the imperial palace and its church on the Lateran in Rome, which is to be the head and summit of all churches all over the world. Third, the highest pontifex, so it's this title now, is allowed to wear imperial vestments, the regalia, that is diadem, scepter, standards and flags. The members of the clergy of the Holy Roman Church in Rome are exalted to the rank of patricians, senators, and even consuls. The Roman Church is permitted to raise its own military. The Roman Church takes over the imperial administration. The Emperor Constantine transfers to the Bishop of Rome the full power to reign over the city of Rome, Italy, and the West. And thus the Roman Church is constituted as a Roman Empire and the Bishop of Rome can act like an emperor. These are the supposed origins, the structure and the claims of Romanized Christianity in the West, that is Roman Catholicism. As, we, as one can easily see in this story, there is no room for Abraham. There is a clear-cut clash between Abrahamic theology and the real history of religions.
Thus far, a rough sketch of the powers which shaped the Western branch of an Abrahamic religion <coughs> to become Roman Catholicism. These powers were not exhausted in this process and swallowed up, but they survived materially and spiritually in monumental ruins, in urban structures, and in innumerable works of art inside and outside the realm of religion. Around 800 Christian era, this field of religions in Western Europe consisted in five or six ancient religions. That you have the list there, Roman Catholicism, the dominant religion. Judaism is tolerated and repressed. This means toleration. Manichism is forbidden, persecuted, and probably in the West already eliminated. I, I have no exact date, but Islam spreading in former Roman provinces in Northern Africa, Spain, and even in Sicily, which had been Rome's first province. Then fifth Germanic, Baltic, and Slavonic religions, these were only objects to be conquered and baptized. And finally, Greek, Roman, Oriental religions, they were forbidden and persecuted. They survived in the form of superstition, desacralized buildings and artifacts, that used and endowed with magical power, etc., or where, as we have seen, integrated within the Christian Church, for example, the title Pontifex Maximus uh, or Pontifex Sumus uh, for the Roman Pope. Besides the living and practiced new religions, then, there remained an older one, no longer practiced, but learned in perfect classical literature admired as art and imitated. In spite of all the destructions and losses, it survived within a cultural context which could gradually be recovered as historical space and scientific and moral resource. Greek political philosophy, for instance, provided arguments for the specific legitimacy of the state, distinct and independent from a theological legitimation. I come to my last point, the humanization. And again, I will begin with a concrete example. Uh, this is with the paradox of the empty hell. And I begin in the middle of the Quattrocento. In 1439 uh, is the uh, Economical Council in Florence just in the time when the humanist movement climbed up to its peak, an ecumenical council was held in Florence. The fathers declared that outside the Roman church, nobody can be saved. No heathen, no Jew, no heretic, no schismatic. That all of them go into the eternal fire that is, pre that is prepared for the devil and his angels. They declared that no sacrament, no fasting, no good deeds, no even the martyrdom can save those being outside the church. In the middle of the 20th century, neither this formidable sentence of exclusion nor the fire and hell boiling and roasting heretics and atheists could be upheld. The impulse of the humanist movement, the criticism of philosophers, and finally, the area of enlightenment had pushed through freedom of religion and an allegory of hell. Thus the western branches of an Abrahamic religion were reshaped and this process might be called humanization. The hell was a hope for helpless poor people who dreamt of justice, at least in the other world. The rich men, says Luke, will burn Hell reflected the cruelties, mutilations, death penalties of the judiciary system in this world. It was doubted and finally abolished by enlightened jurists <coughs> like Cesare Beccaria. Nowadays, hell is to be understood as, I quote, Küng, separation from God. It could be an empty place. Hell is allegorized as the realm of death. Similarly, the condemnation of the major part of humankind could not be upheld in a globalizing world. After an epoch of wild protest 
against the French Declaration of Human Rights and especially against freedom of religion, the Catholic and Protestant churches agreed upon these fundamental rights. Humanization means first to reduce or abolish violence, brute force, pain, the real and the imaginary pain. This is meant for all areas of human society, in warfare, penal system, medicine, educational system. The opposition to violence, cruelty, savagery, brutality and all forms of inhumanity is the basic principle of what Latin is called humanitas. Therefore, Marcus Tullius Cicero, the patriarch of European humanism, declares humanitas the opposite of feritas, crudelitas, servitia. All this, he says, is the behavior of wild beasts. Humaniz humanization means, furthermore, to receive the studia humanitatis, the scholarly study of language, texts and manuscripts, the techniques of rhetoric, poetic historiography, a strong impulse to educating children as well as adults, as practiced, for instance, by Erasmus in his colloquia and proverbs. And finally, humanization means the implementation and consolidation of human rights on the basis of freedom, self-determination, equality and justice. These three dimensions of humanization can be observed in the formation of Western Abrahamic religion. Already in antiquity, Christian authors and used classical philology and historiography to edit in and interpret their holy writ or to narrate the origin and growth of the church as did Luke in his two volumes. The reception of Plato and Aristotle, the ever recurring rejection of Epicurus and the ambivalent position towards skepticism are old and ongoing attempts of theologians to cope with the intellectual achievements of ancient and modern philosophy or respectively to crush the heresies of the time. This interaction has formed Western theology over the centuries, the last steps being existentialist interpretation or materialist uh, social reading of the New Testament. I think this is the last picture. The natural rights of man as declared by the French National Assembly in 1789, are applied natural law. They are the specific Western European result emerging from classical philosophy of law and modern enlightenment. The declaration transfers natural, natural and rational law into revolutionary action. Human rights are natural rights, says the French declaration, they are innate, inherent in every individual. They are giving by nature, that is, these rights are not assigned by one's <coughs> family or by the clan or by the state. Being innate, these rights cannot be abrogated. Human rights are individual, subjective rights of every human person. They express the autonomy and dignity of the individual. The tenth article of the Declaration reads as follows, I quote, No one shall be disquieted, inquiété in French, on account of his opinions, including his religious views, provided their manifestation does not disturb the public order established by law. Freedom of religion is introduced here as a special case of the general freedom of opinion and speech, not as an independent right. This procedure of the French National Assembly brings to evidence the following two points. First, the demand for religious freedom is not the core or driving force of the modern human rights movement. Second, the incorporation of religious freedom into the more comprehensive right of freedom of opinion, speech and press goes far beyond earlier attempts which claimed mutual toleration of the Christian churches and its guarantee by the government. In this context then, freedom of religion gained the status of a human right. 
the reactions to the declaration of 1789 were quite divergent. On the one side, we see the decided implementation to positive law, the transfer to legal traditions of various nations, and finally, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaimed in 1948, again in Paris. On the other side, there is a resolute refutation. It is sheer monstrosity, writes the Vatican in 1791, I quote, that it should be left to the judgment of the individual what he wishes to think, speak, write and publish in print. Protestant theologians too were reluctant or openly rejected human rights. It is only in the middle of the 20th century that Christian churches and theologians turned abruptly to acknowledge what they could not change. In this way again, a Western Abrahamic religion was integrated into the framework of European culture. Abrahamic theology and global, global ethic are a clear result of this turn. This project demonstrates how the ideas of freedom and equality, the cornerstones of the French Declaration of Natural Rights of Men, finally transform some parts of the Western branch of Christianity. The well-known icon of Joseph Chinard exhibits these principles, the genius of the Republic and its Roman tradition. The Roman tradition is this uh, bundle. Uh, yes, you will know it. Uh, this is a sign of sovereignty of the consul or uh, whoever goes with a lictor and has this bundle of, uh, how do you say, the, the bundle of Roden, das Rodenbündel. I wouldn't like to say fascist, fascist but, but fascist. is it? it? <laughs> so, then, well, this is a sign of sovereignty of the magistrates and above is the cap of emancipation and on the left and the right are the principles of equality and uh, um, uh, what is the other? Liberty. Liberty, yes, it stands. Yes, it stands below the figures, and then the uh, two tables of uh, rights and law. As I have stated already in the beginning of my lecture, Abrahamic theology and global ethic acknowledge human rights and the dignity and equality of all religion, even of indigenous religions. Hell shall remain empty. The project pushes ethic into foreground, allegorizes myths and dogmas, picks up the warnings of the Club of Rome as well as the topics of green ecology and puts cult and mystery into the background. This is the profile of a modernized religion transformed by the long-lasting impact of humanization. The project remains, however, religion and theology. In global ethics, to give an example, human rights are said to be only formally on the level of rights. They ought to be deepened and confirmed by global ethic. This ethic in its turn is recovered from the, I quote, primordial wisdom of our religions. It was, however, the decisive step towards the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Paris 1948, to eliminate theological and speculative discussions. It is not wise to denounce right, law, justice as formal, incomplete and in need of being supplemented by religious wisdom. Karl Josef Kuschel has recommended that, I quote, religions should show the way for politics. They should bear the torch before the politician. The result can be seen in the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam. Here human rights are agreed upon, provided they are compatible with Islam. Islamic law is the provision under which human rights are implemented into the Arab Charter on Human Rights. And this is a lesson from this story, for me at least, sacralizing human rights is weakening human rights. I come to a conclusion. Dear colleagues, 
I told you some impressive stories. St. Paul in Athens encounters Hellenismus. St. Paul in, Co in Corinth encounters Roman authority. I told you what is depicted on the shield of, of Achilles and what is not depicted. I, I told you how Constantine the Great gave the western part of his empire to the Church of Rome. And I showed you some beautiful pictures. The Berlin Pantheon and Berlin sacred landscape. You will imagine this. Christus Imperator from Ravenna. The allegories of liberty and equality from Paris. All these stories and pictures served only one purpose. They were to embellish and to hide the formidable accumulation of abstract terms in the title of my lecture. They were to make concrete and tangible what is meant by clumsy terms like Hellenization or humanization. The sheer naming of Athens and Rome, Paris and Berlin was to produce a suggestive image of the crude entity which is called, boldly enough, framework of Western European culture in the provisional title of my lecture. My intention is to observe processes of transformation, the interaction of religion and culture, and to single out some factors which have shaped, to some degree, Western Christianity. These factors are the Greco-Roman heritage, the humanist movement, and, and enlightenment. The various impacts of these factors, or the lack of an impact, could be observed in other religions as well, and not only in the many different families of monotheistic religions. This is a narrow but a productive field of comparative religious history. Abrahamic, theology, Abrahamic theology and the global ethic, as represented here by the works of Hans Küng and Karl Josef Kuschel, can be understood as a further step in the process of humanization of religion. Their merits are indisputable. I mention only their call for toleration and their explicit condemnation of religious motivated violence. History, however, tells us that freedom of religion and human rights have not been produced by religions. They cannot be guaranteed by organizations based on the wisdom of religions. Freedom of religion and peaceful interface relations, history tells us, rest on a broad civil consensus, on social and political freedom, on self-determination and on general security. So, I thank you for your patience and uh, you, you will condone me the absence of some pictures and I'm anxious for the